People like us, who believe in physics, know that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Albert Einstein We can only live in the present. The future has not yet happened and the past is history. We are bound by the laws of our perception to only see time as constantly and steadily moving forward. This is our reality. But what if we could go beyond this reality? What if we could slip through the linear perception of time and experience something in the past or even the future? According to folklore, there are a number of people who have done just that. Join us tonight as we pierce through the veil of time on this Great Scott episode of Snipe Hunt. Alright, welcome back to Snipe Hunt, your frightening folklore podcast. I am your anachronistic host, Darren Young. So proud of you. Thank you. I just breezed right through <laughs> it. I was like, just do it. Just do it. And I am your timeline variant host, Gary Clevenstein. Thank you for taking the time to slip into this episode. I get it. Have, have you watched Loki on Disney Plus yet? Not, no. Hashtag not sponsored. But, no, no. but that's why I just, I figured I should put the timeline variant thing because it plays a huge role in the show. But Really? You should watch it. It's a good show. I did, I did uh, Captain and Falcon. I Falcon thought, and the Winter Soldier. Honestly, I thought that was the weakest of the three shows. Really? So far. Yeah, I liked WandaVision better. See, Savannah loved WandaVision. I couldn't get into it. I, I thought it was really good. Okay, but we're not. But anyways, yeah. We're not a Marvel show review podcast, <laughs> at least not yet. As the time wordplay suggests, we are talking about time slips today. Not to be confused with the 1970 British TV show of the same name. Gary, have you ever time traveled before uh yeah i'm, I'm doing it right now <laughs> technically we are, are traveling through time we're yeah in the future the future but quantum um, leap man but not that's not actual time travel though no okay so i haven't traveled through time before but i have after I know this because an old disheveled looking guy told me that he was me from the future and that I should give him $20 so he could get enough gas to go back to the future. So of course, I'm always willing to help me out. So I gave me that $20 and watched future me cackle and limp down the alleyway while yelling something about crystal. Uh, I, I assume he was referring to some <laughs> sort of magic crystal he uses to power his time machine. So, so I will time travel, just not yet. Uh, I, I can't wait, dude. Just let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you were not expecting that. I word. was not. I'm like, what, is, what are you doing? <laughs> what is he going on? <laughs> Just so you know, we are recording with the AC on because it's way too freaking hot outside to not. Oh, I didn't... so enjoy the AC. I yeah. mean, it's still pretty hot in here because we gave off a lot of heat, but you know, it's that's all me. Oh yeah, yeah. I can tell. I can feel it radiating on my side of the table. At least I don't. St- I don't stink. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad you had to Actually, check. I just got off work. Yeah, me too. Quick announcement. There is a new $10 tier on our Patreon page called the Snipe Master Hunter tier. You get all the benefits of the previous tiers, topic voting, bonus content, digital logo, etc. But you also get two new exclusive benefits as well. What do they get, Gary? Well, Darren, I'm glad you asked. They get Snipe Hunt raw and uncut. Not only do Master Hunters get to listen to episodes before they officially come out, but they get to listen to all of our mistakes as as we make them before edited, as these episodes are completely unedited, like I just said, except for the sound quality, which is edited to make it sound better. Yes, I'm leaving all of my ums in, I'm leaving all of Mm. our mess ups in, I'm leaving everything in. Um, hey, there's one. This has been requested <laughs> by at least two people, Gary and Jeremy. That's a really good deal. It's uh, You get early access to the episode. You get it all unedited. So maybe that's your thing. Maybe it's not. But what is the other thing they get? They get exclusive Snipe Hunt merch. Woo! Patrons that are Snipe Master Hunters for three months get a Snipe Hunt logo sticker shipped directly to them via Patrons Merch Shop. Patreon's Merch Patreon's, Shop. <laughs> Patreon's Merch Shop. Yes, yeah. the site is called Patreon, and if you donate, you're a patron. There you go. Yeah. And 
Gary, I bet if we get more patrons, we can expand even better merch. That's right, Darren. Visit today at <laughs> patreon.com slash snipe hunt and see which tier is best for you. Yeah, that's right. We're not going to stop asking you for your money. I, I don't know if we deserve it, but you know, it's more of like a charity kind of thing. Give us all your money. Like you feel bad for us. So you give us money. <laughs> Help me. I'm poor. <laughs> Another announcement. I have finally broken down and got us a TikTok where I'll be posting clips of the episode and Gary will be doing something on there. Or I have so, ideas. Or so I'm told. I have ideas. So I did post one clip and I ran a little promotion. We already have 243 followers on that, Gary. I know. That's, that's literally that's more crazy. than every other, <laughs> every other social media one combined. So I think that people will like the clips. We, I did upload a pretty good clip. Yeah. So follow us on there. Uh, just look up. Uh, we're on there at Snipe Hunt Podcasts if you aren't following already. Now let's slip into some time. I'm sure that'll be the last time you hear that word play. Right. <laughs> this is a phenomenon some of you might actually be familiar with. It is a relatively common plot device in fantasy and science fiction, but let's call upon Definition Man first. It's the same as Game Show Man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what, whatever works for you. A time slip is when a person or group of people accidentally travel through time via unknown means or witness an anachronistic event. The person usually has no control or understanding of the process, and it is often only a temporary circumstance. As mentioned earlier, it is sometimes used as a plot device using myths and fictional tales, which we will review to familiarize ourselves with this concept, but we'll mainly focus on the more contemporary, true experiences with the strange phenomenon. Uh, there seems to be several types of time slip experiences. There's the fast forward time slip in which the experiencer either falls into a trance or travels to another often mystical place only to return that find that several years has passed, even though the time slipper only experienced a few minutes, days, or weeks. Uh, there's the true travel time slip in which the experiencers are literally transported to another time. And then there's the time window time slip which is uh, the experiences remain in their time, but witness something clearly from another time. That was one that other people didn't really throw into this, but I'm throwing it in now where you see something that's definitely out of place for your time. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the myth and fiction time slips and we'll move on from there. So I'll keep these stories brief since they aren't our primary focus, but our first myth comes from both Christian and Islamic traditions. The story has a few alternating titles, including The Seven Sleepers, The Sleepers of Ephesus, and The Slightly Erotic Companions of the Cave. That'll be our Patreon-exclusive story for mm. adults only. There you and go. That'll be our Snipe on After Dark. <laughs> Companions of the Cave. <laughs> There are several different versions of the story which vary in detail. Some versions have seven or have eight or nine sleepers, and some even include a dog. Uh, but we're going to go with the seven sleepers one because that one sounds the best. So the story goes that seven young Christian men were suffering under the persecution of the Roman Emperor Decius around 250 AD and retired to a cave in order to pray and prepare for death as they were certain that they were to be executed. Decius found the men and ordered the cave to be sealed. The seven resigned themselves to their fate and fell asleep. They were awoken to the cave being unsealed by a landowner who wanted to use the sealed cave as a cattle pen. The seven, thinking they only had slept for one night, sent a couple of their group into the city to buy food as they desired one last meal before their inevitable execution. To their surprise, they discovered that the city looked completely different than they remembered and were shocked to find large crosses adorning buildings. They discovered that 300 years had passed and that Christianity, Christianity, <laughs> that's the alternate pronunciation, and that Christianity was no longer outlawed. In fact, it was the official religion. The local bishop got word of this and went up to the cave and interviewed the sleepers who relayed their story. Then, after a lengthy conversation, they all apparently suddenly died praising God. Hmm. As you do after sleeping for 300 years, I guess. Yeah. So, the, so this is allegedly true story. The exact location of the cave is debated, but a suspected cave is now a religious site located in Jordan near the capital city of Amman. The Seven Sleepers have their own feast day in Germany, which is celebrated on June 27th. Uh, so for funsies, Gary, would you like to attempt the names of the Seven Sleepers? 
I'm gonna have to do this in like a like a like a Russell Crowe like gladiator kind of wrestle WrestleMania. Russell, Russell, oh, <laughs> and in this corner, yeah. Maximian. No, it's like an anime voice. My bad. All right, <laughs> <laughs> Max Maximian. Is that that that, that sounds right? Right, Max. Sure, Maximian. I have no idea. <laughs> Martinian. That's what the martini was named after. Mm -hmm. True story. Dionysius. John. <laughs> hey, you got that one. Constantine. Malchus. Sera Serapian. <laughs> <laughs> the Ser least popular of the knights at the round table. <laughs> I think it's Serapian. Serapian. Or Serapian. Serapian. <laughs> There you go. There you go. And those are the seven sleepers. You don't want to fall asleep in the cave with Serapian, though. <laughs> <laughs> with Serapian. Uh, now, if this narrative, this whole falling asleep and waking up years later sounds familiar, it's because this method of time slip can also be found at Washington Irving's well-known short story, Rip Van Winkle, published in 1819. You've heard Not of it, Not to right? be confused with Vanilla Ice. Yes. In which the titular colonial villager meets a Dutchman in antiquated clothing at the Catskill Mountains of New York. Wait, that's Rob Van Winkle. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> same thing. Same thing. So when you imagine the story, just imagine vanilla ice. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> Winkle helps this mysterious Dutchman carry a keg of liquor up the mountain and meets a group of strangely dressed men with equally strange faces bowling in a flat portion of the hollow. And when I mean bully, I mean like legitimate, like roll the ball down and hit pins. Oh. It was a more antiquated version called Nine Pin, which we still play a version of today. But it's 12 Pin. Yes. Yeah. Nine Pin is like a variation of it. Gotcha. All this work made Winkle mighty thirsty and helped himself to the keg that he helped carry up without asking permission from the Dutchman. What a rude Winkle. V freaking vanilla. He's always been this rude bastard. Drinking other people's drinks without asking. All right, stop. Collaborate and listen, <laughs> please. Soon he drank himself into his soup. He drank himself into a soup. <laughs> he is now a soup. <laughs> um, I hope it's cheddar broccoli. <laughs> he drank himself into a stupor and fell asleep. Upon awakening, he finds that his beard is unkempt and long and that his musket is rusted and rotting. He returns to his village and discovers that everything has changed and that he was missing for 20 years. He is recognized as the long lost Rip Van Winkle or Vanilla Ice and is soon reunited with his now grown son and daughter who and lives out the rest of his days freeloading off of his daughter. We, we've all heard that story before and probably not quite like that, but. All right, so our next myth is a Japanese fairy tale that relays the story of Urashima Taro. And it goes something like this. One day, young Taro is fishing and notices a group of children torturing a small turtle because all children are little psychopaths. Taro saves the turtle from the sadistic children and returns it to the sea. The next day, he is approached by a gigantic turtle who tells him that the small turtle he saved is the daughter of Ryujin, the emperor of the sea, who wants to see Taro. The turtle magically grants the young fisherman gills and brings him to the bottom of the sea to the palace of the dragon god. Sounds awesome. Where he meets the emperor of the sea and reunites with the turtle he saved, who is now a totally hot princess named Otohime. Taro stays with Otohime for three days, I bet he does, but soon wants to return to the land to visit his aging mother and asks to leave. The sea princess wishes him well and gives him a mysterious box called a tamate bako and tells him it will protect him from harm, but he must not ever open it. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a piss box. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't say if Taro actually smelled the box or not. I read tomato bake. <laughs> right. <laughs> Tomate bako. It sounds like a tomato dish. Um, he returns home, but as you may have guessed, everything has changed. His home, his mother, and everything he once knew is gone. He asked around to see if anyone knew of him and finally got the answer that Urashima Taro was the name of a man who disappeared at sea 300 years ago. The distraught Taro then opened the box that was given to him and a puff of white smoke came out. He suddenly aged into an old man with a white beard and a bent back. From the sea, he hears the sad voice of the princess who said, I told you not to open that box. In it was your old age. 
I wish I could put my old age in a box. I know. In a tomato bake. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are many other myths that depict this kind of skip forward in time, including more words we're about to mispronounce. The story of King Raivata Kakudmi, who travels to heaven to meet the Hindu creator God Brahma, only to return to earth to find that several millions of years have passed and that mankind was at a lower level of development than in Kakudmi's own time. So that one's interesting because it's kind of like, as opposed to the other ones, like 20 to 300 years, it's literally like millions of years and mankind has already gone through all of its stages, destroyed itself, and now it's starting over. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Mm. We also have the explanation of Kermara Kasapa, one of Buddha's chief disciples, that time in heaven passes differently to that on earth. The story of Hani Ha Miguel. Hani Ha Miguel. <laughs> yeah, sure. The first century BC Jewish scholar who fell asleep for 70 years in a rocky enclosure and woke up and met his own grandson. So yeah, lot, lots of stories about these f fast forward time slips. But these time slips only skip forward in time and are definitely not instantaneous events. And they view time as a linear constant. Before we continue on with more contemporary accounts, let's take a look at some theories that view time as more malleable in which terms like past, present, and future are less certain. Are you ready for me to throw some science at you, Gary? I'm ready. As you know, me and you are very well respected within the science community mm -hmm. and our degrees reflect that. Exactly. Yeah. In all our honorary degrees and our various things. So we're, we're, pretty, we're practically experts in this. So anything you, we, you hear from us about, about this subject, you know you can trust 100%. Don't look it up. Um, anything you see, if you do look it up, anything you see that contradicts us, it's totally wrong. We're right. They're wrong. And we're horrible to English. Oh, yeah. That's what, because we devoted so much of our time to science. The first is that not everything experiences time in the same way. Physicist Albert Einstein, never heard of him, proposed that space and time were interwoven into a single fabric called space-time. He also showed that the concept of time is relative to the observer. For example, an object moving extremely fast, approaching the speed of light, will experience time slower than a stationary object. Additionally, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, the closer an object is to an immense gravitational force, such as a black hole, the slower time goes. These changes in time are known as time dilation. Uh, this theory shows at the very least that there is no universal now for all objects. Uh, throw gravity in the mix, there's even less of a universal present. Basically, the more gravity one is subjected to, the slower time is perceived. Think of the movie Interstellar, if you've seen it. I have not. I've never heard of it. You've never heard of Interstellar by Christopher Nolan? Mm -mm. Starring uh, Matthew McConaughey? Mm -mm. Really? Yeah. It was pretty popular when it came out. Hmm. I couldn't tell you when, but... <laughs> <laughs> Basically, if you somehow survive the extreme gravitational pull of a black hole, your perception in time would be extremely slow. But of course, we know all this being scientists and all. Mm -hmm. um, some theories take it even further than this. Theoretical physicist Carlo Rovelli says that time does not actually exist, but is an illusion created by our perception of reality. He says that time does not exist in physics at the fundamental level. Now, I couldn't find a satisfying summary of, of his theory, and I don't want to bog down this entire episode with it, so just know that some very smart people think that the flow of time may not exist as we know it. I've even seen some claims that every event is happening at once, but we are perceiving these events as happening on different points of time because that's the only way we can actually perceive it. Our human minds cannot comprehend, so we have to stretch everything out. Is that like that saying, time is a construct? Yes, exactly. This echoes sort of back to our glitches reality episode where we're talking about our reality is actually a simulation. None of it's real. So this kind of has the same sort of vibe to it is that time doesn't exist except in our minds because that's how we perceive reality. Hmm. Right. Mind blowing stuff. <laughs> now keep in mind that Carlo Ravelli was high on LSD when he started coming up with his theories. But you know, man, it frees the mind, man. Mm. I could honestly go a lot further into the theoretical physics of time. Uh, so let's do that now. No, I'm just kidding. We don't have time for that. Nor the credentials to do so. I was lying about being a scientist. Sorry, I know I fooled all of you. Speak for yourself. Yeah, Gary's actually a scientist. Just know that time itself 
seems to be somewhat malleable. Now that we have some context, both from mythology and scientific theory, let's jump into some actual time slip accounts. Let's start with the Versailles time slip. <laughs> so the uh, I'm assuming the L's are silent. Yeah, Versailles is that place in France. Versailles, Versailles. This is Versailles. Versailles. Yes. I would have said Versailles. <laughs> Versailles. In the alleged year 1901, two college professors would have the strangest of experiences. Anne Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain of St. Hugh's College in Oxford were vacationing in France. While there, they set out to visit the Palace of Versailles. The official royal residence and political seat of France from 1682 until the French Revolution of 1789. Guidebook in hand, they headed towards the palace but quickly became lost when their surroundings became suddenly unfamiliar. Soon a heavy oppressive feeling came over them. Walking towards what they hoped was the palace, they passed three men who were very dignified officials dressed in long grayish green coats with small three-cornered hats. As they passed a cottage, reality seemed to distort even more. The cottage itself did not look entirely real and the couple felt a change in the atmosphere. Moberly would later write, Everything suddenly looked unnatural, therefore unpleasant. Even the trees seemed to have come flat and lifeless, like woodwork and tapestry. There were no effects of light and shade, and no wind stirred the trees. After passing a couple more figures dressed in antiquated clothing, they finally reached the gardens of the Palace of Versailles. It was there that Moberly noticed a lady sketching on the grass. The lady was wearing a light dress, a delicate wide-brimmed sun hat, and had long, light-colored hair. The lady seemed to notice the professors too as they passed as she paused her sketching and looked up at them. Upon arrival at the palace, the oppressive and reality distorting feelings passed and they enjoyed their tour of the palace with a tour group as normal. Still uneasy after their strange experience, they later compared notes of their experience and wondered if they had somehow gone back in time. They revisited the area several times but were unable to retrace their steps. They followed up with the palace gardens to see if they possibly stumbled across a private party of people in period clothing. That's a tongue twister for you. That's what I was a private party of possibly people in stumbled. period clothing. Yeah, there you go. Private party of people in period clothing. Good job. I think of gross things when I say period clothing. <laughs> anyway. But nothing was booked that day. Finally, after intensely studying the history of the area, they concluded that they had gone back in time to 1792 only six weeks before the abolition of the French monarchy. In her investigation, Moberly was able to unravel the identity of the mysterious woman in the garden. That woman, Moberly claimed, was none other than Marie Antoinette, the last queen of France. Insert dun 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 here. Yeah. So, went back in time, allegedly, and saw Marie Antoinette. Do you remember Mary, Marie Antoinette from your history class? I've heard the name. Yes. I don't know Jack Squat about her. I think I think the main thing people attribute uh, with her is uh, that she said, it, w in response to when the French people couldn't afford food, she said, "Let them eat cake." She didn't say that, by the way. Oh, but, I was say but, but it's attributed to her. Um, it's it's kind of like a whole thing. It's this is right before the overthrow of the French monarchy, so nobody had a great view on nobles, and she was kind of a scapegoat for like lavish overspending and all that stuff. So her and her husband were beheaded uh, not not long after. Uh, <laughs> there you I go. I would have thought she would have said, oh, oh, oh. "Let them eat." No. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 but no, she didn't say that. Uh, apparently, she was actually a pretty good queen as far as queens go. I guess I am a queen. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> Carrying around her baguettes and. Smoking her cig cigar <laughs> cigarettes and other French stereotypes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the story. Um, any thoughts on it? Mm -mm. So I will say that Moberly saw Marie Antoinette and all this other stuff. Well, her companion, I forget what her name was, uh, did not. When they compared experiences, they experienced similar stuff, like an impressive feeling and a weird sight. But they didn't all see the same thing. So just keep that in mind. 
Come to find out, Moberly 2 was on LSD. Yeah, it, it almost <laughs> sounds like it with her, with her descriptions of nothing looking real and all that stuff. I actually don't give a lot of credence to this. I think they were just in an unfamiliar place. They're visiting France. They're tourists. They got lost. They're bored. Kind of, Maybe they panicked a little bit. Had a little bit of culture shock. I don't know. But the garden that they were visiting was actually a common venue to throw garden parties where period costume was worn. Famous French dandy, and yes, he is described as a dandy, Robert de Montesquieu would often hold these parties on palace grounds. So likely explanation is they got lost, but when they got to the garden, they passed one of Robert de Montesquieu's uh, parties where they're dressed like old-timey stuff. So maybe a time slip, but I don't think so. On to our next one. This is the time slip of Drem Airfield. Drem Airfield almost sounds like an action hero. <laughs> You're right. <Yeah. laughs> Loose cannon cop, Drem Airfield. <laughs> In 1935, Air Marshal Sir Victor Goddard of the British Royal Air Force was sent to inspect an abandoned airfield in Drem, not far from Edinburgh in Scotland. Flying over the Drem airfield, he saw exactly what he expected. A run-down airfield with dilapidated buildings, overgrown vegetation, and even cattle that grazed where planes once sat. While flying home, Goddard encountered an unexpected storm. Some accounts state that this was a particularly bizarre storm with yellowish-brown clouds and winds forming a vortex around his plane. Very Bermuda Triangle-y. Goddard decided to return to the Drem airfield to regain his bearings. As he approached the airfield, the rain suddenly stopped and gave way to bright sunshine. He looked down at the airfield and saw that it had been completely renovated and was in use, despite him visiting the same disused and crumbling site earlier that day. The site was now populated by mechanics in blue overalls walking around, and four yellow planes were parked on the runway. Goddard became even more confused as uh, Royal Air Force mechanics dressed in khaki overalls and painted the planes a silvery aluminum color. The mystery deepened further as the mechanics did not seem to notice the pilot as he flew over the airfield and strangest of all, Goddard, despite all of his aviation experience, did not recognize one of the planes parked on the runway. Goddard then left the area and returned to Andover. Some accounts say that he encountered the same storm on the way out. Four years later, in 1939, war was breaking out in Europe and Goddard once again visited the Drim airfield, only to find it exactly as he had seen it four years earlier in his strange experience. The airfield had been completely renovated, mechanics were wearing blue overalls, and serviced yellow planes. He even discovered that the plane that he failed to recognize in 1935, a Miles Magister, a new model of plane that first took off in 1937. Hmm. So in the original account, I did was able to actually find that where it was first originally written. It says he encountered a storm and that's why he turned back. And then uh, I saw on like the same account on like different websites and stuff. That's where they describe the weird yellowy brown vortex clouds of the storm. So I think that part's totally made up. This is the same basic story as Amelia Earhart, ain't it? Kind of. Well, Amelia Earhart disappeared. Uh, Goddard did not. That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean. Well, not exactly. Apples and oranges. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's planes, there's possible storms, there's weird happenings. So I guess you're not too far off base. Um, but uh, so when I first read this story, I was like, oh, this sounds like pretty legit. Like he saw the airfield that was renovated when it wasn't supposed to be. And then he got out of there and it wasn't renovated anymore. But then four years later, it was renovated. And the model of plane didn't show up until two years after his sighting. So it seems legit on the front. Wait a right? minute. Wait a minute. This just in. Hold on. Hold on. This just in. Goddard 2 was on LSD. Oh, my God. LSD was just <laughs> rampant in the 1930s. <laughs> rampant, I tell you. The more I looked into this, the more it made sense that he was simply just mistaken. So here's the rational explanation. The store made Goddard lose his bearings, uh, which was easy to do back in the day because it was mostly like, uh, how are you going to get there? Don't worry, I have a map and instincts. Um, so it was really easy to lose your bearings back in the day. And uh, so I think he lost those. And then he ended up flying over Renfrew Aerodrome, an airfield run by the Scottish Flying Club. 
Uh, the civilian airfield would often paint their planes bright colors and not adhere to RAF uniform standards. And as far as the new model plane goes, the predecessor to the Miles Magister was available in 1935, same year as the sighting, and was extremely similar to the Magister in looks. So, once again, maybe a time slip, but probably not. Same architect for everything. Yeah. And just confusion. Let's move on to a time slip experience that's more difficult to explain, shall we? Let's and who better it. to explain it than myself? You know, other than the LSD explanation. <clears throat> right. It's, that's the, the answer for everything is LSD. It's true. Literally any episode of this podcast would be like, it was probably LSD. Yeah, yeah. Newspaper reporter Jay Bernard Hutton and photographer Joachim Brandt were assigned to do a story on a shipyard located in Hamburg, Germany in 1932. They traveled to the shipyard, did their respective jobs, and finished by late afternoon. As the pair was about to leave, they heard the roar of several aircraft engines and looked to the sky to find it filled with fighter planes. They heard Hamburg's local anti-aircraft batteries fire at the invading warplanes and witnessed multiple bombs explode around them. Fuel tanks exploded and a raging fire surrounded them. Buildings were collapsing. Hunt and Brandt rushed to their car, desperate to escape the chaos. They made it to the security gate and asked the officer there if there was anything they could do to help but were ordered to leave the area immediately. They drove into Hamburg proper and were surprised to find that the once dark sky was now clear and the city completely undamaged. They looked back at the shipyard they had just escaped and saw no smoke or fire. All buildings intact, no warplanes in the sky, and the sounds of the attack had completely ceased. Throughout the air raid, Brandt had kept rolling and caught the entire attack on film. Or so he thought. Upon developing the film, the two men were surprised to see nothing unusual. All of the pictures showed the shipyard as completely normal. No signs of the air raid whatsoever. They explained this to their editor who accused them of drinking on the job, and the whole case was dismissed. Yeah, their editor accused them of being on LSD. No, it was drinking. I'm saying drinking they, were on, LSD. they were on LSD. <laughs> in 1943, Bernard Hutton was now living in London and was reading the local newspaper. He went white as he was reading that day's top story. Britain's Royal Air Force had executed a successful raid on a Hamburg shipyard. The shocked Hutton studied the included photos and recognized the scene as exactly what he and Brandt had experienced on that fateful day 11 years ago. Insert another dun dun dun. This he's now been clean and sober for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, he is, he's not been drinking, he's not been on LSD, but he, he knows what he saw 11 years ago. So this one I thought was interesting because... Yeah, there, there wasn't really a rational explanation I could think for this one. They experienced like a whole huge thing of everything exploding around them, planes in the sky, uh, anti-aircraft batteries being fired. Um, even the guard was like, you got to get out of here. So they experienced the whole thing only to find out that it didn't happen, at least not yet. And then 11 years later, it did happen. That was deja vu. Deja vu. Yeah, exactly. But they experienced this before because they went through a time slip. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. Interesting. But yeah, I thought this was a little bit more robust than the other stories for sure. Our next experience of this strange phenomena, we have a somewhat well-known figure, Carl Jung, the founder of analytical psychology, whose work has helped shape the field of psychology as we know it today. Uh, once again, we traveled to the 1930s, apparently the best decade for time slips because all of our stories have been from the <laughs> 1930s, and joined Carl Jung and a female acquaintance in the ancient city of Ravenna, Italy. Jung was there to visit the mausoleum of Galla Placidia, the daughter of a Roman emperor who was a major force in Roman politics most of her life, and was entombed in the mausoleum upon her death in 450 AD. Young had first visited the tomb in 1913 and described falling into a strange mood and felt the same sensation on his second visit. Young and his lady friend left the tomb and went directly to another historical site, the Baptistry of Neon, the most ancient monument remaining in Ravenna. Upon entering the building, 
Young described being struck by soft blue light that filled the room. Young was amazed by four great mosaic frescoes of incredible beauty, which he did not recall seeing during his first visit to the site. Young was so impressed with the mosaics that he tried to purchase any photos or postcards of these works of art, but was annoyed when he could not find any. He was pressed for time, so he returned home and asked an acquaintance, who was due to visit the site, to pick him up a postcard of the mosaics. When his friend returned, however, it was explained that the photos of the mosaics could not be found, as the mosaics that Young described did not exist. Young was perplexed and proposed in his semi-autographical book that he had experienced a time slip due to his strong connection with Gala Placidia. He explained that he must have seen the site through her eyes in her time 1,500 years ago. Young's unidentified female companion also saw the allegedly ancient mosaics. So yeah, we're time slipping through Rome and seeing some, seeing some cool stuff, apparently. According to which I, I found this one interesting because he seems the other one seemed credible too, but this is like an actual like hardcore scientist, you know, who knows all about the minds and the tricks that, that it can play on oneself. And he himself is like, yeah, no, it was I definitely slipped through time. <laughs> I definitely saw saw the site as one would see it fifteen hundred years ago. I was wondering what it'd be like to I do ask people this. If you had the option just for one day, and I usually think about this when I'm playing Red Dead online. <laughs> if you had the option to go live in that world for one day or a week, let's say a week, would you do it? Uh, it depends on the time, but yeah, most likely, absolutely, I would definitely. Well, do I mean, it. what is it? The 1890, 1900s? Yeah. So it? if we're talking Red Dead Redemption and we go yeah. live on the frontier 1890, for a week, yeah, I could make it a week in the frontier. Probably not much longer than that because I'm very comfy in my air conditioning. But right. But yeah, I would definitely do it. That would be a once in a lifetime experience for sure. That stuff, like uh, some of these stories are just boring the hell out of me. <laughs> but like, <laughs> that's fair. But that's to think fair. about like. I think you would be less bored if you were experiencing them. Right. Well, and like to be able to like go back in time to those times and yep. actually be able to take your present self with like your inventory that's in your pockets right, yeah. with you. How well would that be? To be able to tell somebody who's wearing a loincloth that you have a device that plays music. Honestly, I don't think they'd be that impressed because they wouldn't understand the technology of it. They'd be like, oh, okay, that box makes noise. Why do I care? Fair point. <laughs> Fair point. Yeah, it makes noise and light. I mean, some of them might be fascinated, but I think the vast majority of them is like, uh, okay, you have fun with that. We we gotta go we gotta go hunt and gather. Yeah. We got we got stuff to do. Yeah. You can sit there and twiddle your thumbs on yeah. that thing. We uh we got better stuff to do. Fair. Maybe if you like, maybe you went back to Leonardo da Vinci and was like, Hey, check this out. I'd be like, Whoa. Whoa. But then the question is, would the the sh stuff on your phone work? Hmm? Well, I think as long as I had a battery life, I don't think you would be able would it to work because that stuff's not. Well, you wouldn't be able to get on the internet or have any service, but right. it'd just be like an offline phone. You wouldn't be able to charge so it. So you wouldn't be able to like show Leonardo da Vinci like some other art because you could show the internet you, does not exist. You could show it if you had it saved on your phone. Unless you took screenshots. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He'd be like, hey, check this out. Yeah. <laughs> what? I haven't painted that yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So I know. I know you've been bored with these stories, but our last no, story. No, I mean, no, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's, it's that's. No, I, I'm telling you, fine. you are not going to be bored with this one. I okay. promise you. Okay. If you're bored with this one, then we can just stop the but podcast. You know right no, here. you know what's funny? You know what's funny is we did that episode with the. Um, we had another one with time. I forget what the, we called it. The, it was about time. Uh, portals. Portals, I believe. Like, I, I do you know what I'm talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. That must be your other. Remember, no, 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 a glitch in reality. Yeah, we had the glitch, glitch in reality. Glitch in yeah, reality. That's I was talking that about one, I loved it. Like, fascinated me. Like, like, and I thought this one was going to absolutely blow, blow me away. Blow away, yeah. Yeah, but it's just like, it, it, it's just. Oh, this guy had a weird thing happen. Yeah. And I think that's the majority of our story. But yeah, this is definitely less sexy than other stuff we yeah. covered before. But I felt like we had to cover it because it is. Oh, right. No, absolutely. Whether or not. This is, it's an entertaining phenomenon. It's definitely an intriguing one. Right. I actually, it's actually, I think it's one of those things where it's more entertaining to read about. Right. But yeah. Watch some YouTube videos. Yeah. Type exactly. stuff. Yeah. And watch some, uh, Carlo Ravelli trip on LSD and talk about weird theories. Well, like Darren said, we have one more story for you, but this is going to be different. Oh yeah. 
We will use this story to introduce a new concept about time slips. We're going to throw a cryptid into the mix, yeah. which is what we're all about. Definitely. One known as the Partridge Creek Monster. This encounter was published in 1908 in the French magazine, Je Sois Toi. <laughs> Sure. That was perfect, wasn't it? I, I come on. I, was, I don't think it was spelled that I was way. curious how that was going to come out, and I think it sounded perfect. That works. And the British, uh, the Strand Magazine. All right, Gary. Here's your story. Oh, man. I'm probably building it up too much. <laughs> <laughs> Miner Tom Lee Moore and banker James Lewis Butler were hunting moose near Clear Creek in the Yukon Territory of Canada. They came upon huge tracks made by clawed feet that measured two and a half feet wide, as well as impressions which they assumed belonged to the creature's long tail dragging behind it. They followed the tracks, but they curiously disappeared. They decided to hunt whatever this enormous beast was. After picking up writer George Sepoy and Reverend L and Reverend Lavagno, who was already ready to go on a previously planned hunting trip, they set out to where they first saw the tracks. After a lengthy stakeout, they suddenly heard a thunderous roar, and out of the frozen brush emerged a gigantic, 30-foot-long creature with gray bristles on its hide and a single horn on its snout. The hunters were petrified, and it would be understandable if they filled their pants with fear, but that is not recorded. What is recorded is that the monster fortunately ignored them and lumbered into a nearby ravine. It was with Sasquatch. Depoy was originally not going to put the story in writing, as he was afraid that no one would believe them. It was in 1907 when Depoy received a letter from the Reverend Lavagno claiming that the missionary had once again spotted the monster. A monster which Lavagno could only describe as a dinosaur. Lavigneau was traveling with 10 First Nation peoples on Christmas Eve and once more saw the great beast running across the frozen river, leaving large chunks of broken ice in its wake. Its eyes were gleaming and the bristles that covered its body were covered in frost. It carried an entire caribou in its jaws and as suddenly as it came, it suddenly disappeared. The members of the tribe the reverend was traveling with also saw the dino and followed the tracks that it left only for once again the trail to disappear. The beast described was a tribute to be a ceratosaurus, a carnivorous T-Rex-like theropod which sported a single small horn on the end of its snout, a dinosaur which has been extinct for 145 million years. That's a long time. That is a long time. So what about that one? That, I did like that. That uh, tingle your jimmies? I, liked, I, I did. I, I uh, chubbed up a little on that one. The, the, <laughs> the, um, yeah, I, yeah. I, had a, I was playing it in my head like a, like a movie, and I really, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I heard about this account a long time ago and just stuck with me ever since. And I wanted to include a living dinosaur tale in this story, so I figured that would be the perfect one. I thought about, like, I thought it was like a porcupine. It was a big old porcupine. <laughs> <laughs> big old porcupine. I got bobcat. So this one, um, it does seem very fantastical, given a uh, huge dinosaur uh, flickering. Was supposedly. that gray bristles on its butt? Yes, and I, I'm going to get to the bristles. Sorry, okay, go ahead. The bristles are actually a very important part of the veracity of this story. Hmm. Although the feathered dino Archaeopteryx, Archaeopteryx, I can never pronounce that, uh, fossil was discovered in the 1860s, it was generally considered the first bird, and scientists consider these fossils to be isolated examples of feathered dinosaurs and that most dinosaurs did not have feathers. It wasn't until 1996 when the Sinosoporotix... <laughs> I used to be a dino kid, so Remember you Remember, y'all, uh, we are scientists. Yes. When the Sinosoporotix was un... That's not how you pronounce it. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> ...was unearthed, did we consider that theropods, a family of three-toed dinosaurs, of which the T-Rex is a member, also had feather-like structures. Ceratosaurus is a theropod. So it's curious that the witnesses described bristles on this beast in a time when scientists thought this family of dinosaurs was featherless. So it'd be weird that they include that in the story unless, Gary, they actually saw it. Insert third. Dun dun dun. <laughs>
But yeah, like I said, this one seems very fantastic. Writing fantastical stories about the exciting frontier was all the rage back in those days. So it could be a fictional account. Maybe the bristles are just coincidence. But I would give this definitely more credence, at least than the two ladies in France or the mm-hmm. guy flying over the wrong airfield. I mean, I may be biased just because there's a dinosaur in there. Yeah. But, but you know. All right. That's another thing crazy to think about. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are crazy to think about. You know what else is crazy to think about, Gary? Because mm. we're about to get in some crazy territory right here, right now. Just the two of us. Right here, And whoever's right listening. <laughs> So what I am setting up here, if you haven't guessed it already, is the ultimate fringe theory about time slips. Let's take a turn into crazy town population, you and I. That we humans are not the only ones that experience it, and that many things that we consider supernatural might just be victims of a time slip. Thrust into our reality against their will until they are pulled back into their own time. Uh, There are actually a ton of examples of modern dinosaur sightings, so how could a creature presumed to be extinct, survive with a breeding population undetected for millions of years. They couldn't. However, if such an animal fell into a time slip and was thrust into modern times for modern humans to see, then eventually pulled back into their own time, not leaving any physical evidence. You see, my uh, crown of aluminum foil is forming as we speak. I'm just thinking about crocodiles, my friend. <laughs> crocodiles are true dinosaurs. They are. That and those freaking cassowary birds, those things are scary. What is it? The cassowaries. Hmm. I think they're in New Zealand and Australia, and they're just they're basically just velociraptors, but just they're birds. birds now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they're pretty scary. And they'll they'll disembowel you and they won't give a sh- <laughs> 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 They'll do it without a second thought. Mm-hmm. And they look pretty scary and they sound pretty scary. Uh, apparently they're not that aggressive, but you don't want to encounter one in the wild. Or if you do, you want to back away slowly. So, I'm not just proposing dinosaurs, but I'm also proposing most, if not all, cryptids. Let's go back in time to our interdimensional Bigfoot episode. In that pod, I suggested that Sasquatch might actually be a surviving descendant of a real ancient animal, Gigantopithecus, an enormous ancient ape which might have walked upright on two legs. What if, Gary... Sasquatch was really just this creature who somehow slipped into our own time, leaving tracks and sightings, but quickly disappearing without a trace. It is very much like an interdimensional Bigfoot theory where we right. said he's from another dimension <laughs> <laughs> and appears and disappears without a trace. So that's pretty similar to that. Not only him, but the Loch Ness Monster is the spitting image of a plesiosaur, an ancient marine reptile. Even the older descriptions of La Chupacabra Describe it as a reptile-like being appearing to have leathery or scaly skin, sharp spines running down its back, and in some cases, even leathery wings. Sounds like yet another dinosaur. Wait a minute. My girlfriend calls me a plesiosaurus. (laughs) Sorry. Go ahead. Why? Because you're an ancient marine reptile? (laughs) Yeah. That's why. (laughs) Can relate. But why stop at cryptids? Let's take this even further down the rabbit hole, Gary. The time slip theory might even account for ghosts. Maybe ghosts, namely residual hauntings, are just energy impressions from another time. If we subscribe to the theory that all events are happening at the same time, and that time is just our way of perceiving it all, then the possibility of some events bleeding over into other events seems possible. So when we see a ghost, we might just be looking into a different time and event entirely as opposed to seeing so the spirit like of the dead. The ho- like a hologram of... Yes, exactly. A hologram so you're of seeing something that was going on at that moment. Yes, you're seeing exactly, place. exactly. You're seeing another time bleed into ours. Mm. Mm. So it's, I do like that thought. It's one of these catch-all theories, which I kind of like and kind of don't like because one, because you're like, oh yeah, that explains everything, and then you're just like, and then you think about it, and you're like, well, that's also kind of lame, <laughs> and it's just like nothing in life is there one thing that explains everything. But I thought I would definitely include it mm. in this that. Bigfoot, chupacabra, ghosts, maybe even aliens are just uh, actually beings from another time. Maybe aliens, Gary, are future humans that come back in time and abduct us to study us. That's actually a a legitimate alien theory, is that they messed up their DNA somehow. Who came up with the anal probing, though? That is a good question, and um, we'll get more into the anal probing. Oh. 
very soon because I bumped an episode because there's a special anniversary coming up that I want to cover almost on the exact day of the anniversary. So, And we're going to be talking about anal probes? We're going to be talking about anal probes. Hell yeah. <laughs> I know you've been waiting for that for a long time. Tune in. You're like, man, it's just I love this podcast, but we don't talk about enough anal probing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I heard you, Gary. I took that in consideration and Thank I you. bumped an episode Thank you. just so we can talk about it. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> and other stuff, but you know. We need to do some uh, more Sasquatch erotica. Oh, yeah. Interdimensional Dig- Bigfoot erotica. Okay. Well, I, I the might, same episode. We, we will also be getting into a little bit of that. On That's the- what my <laughs> first TikTok is going to be about. <laughs> So so if you weren't Big, sure about subscribing to the TikTok now, Big now you definitely erotica. have to. Yes. You definitely have to now. Now we have to get back to okay, the boring sorry. stuff before yeah. we wrap it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Enough ridiculous, although fun conjecture. Let's get back to the science. Is it even possible to travel through time? Well, the short answer is maybe possibly, maybe theoretically, but more than likely no. Oh, okay. So pretty firm. To travel to the future, we could use the time dilation method, but that would require humans to harness the power of the immense gravitational acceleration caused by black holes or send a human at a velocity close to or equal to the speed of light. But in order to do this, we would need an infinite amount of energy. It's Einstein's classic E equals MC square equation. Energy and mass are interchangeable forms of the same thing. As an object approaches the speed of light, C, its mass, M, also increases. As the object increases in mass, the more energy, E, is needed to move it, eventually requiring an infinite amount of energy, which puts a cap on how fast an object with mass can actually travel. Oh, okay. I finally understand. E Are you smelling what now. I'm stepping in? I'm smelling it. <laughs> we have an obsession with the smell. Does it smell like cat piss? <laughs> it smells uh, <laughs> va- faintly of cat piss and maybe some, uh, what was it? Like lilies or I don't know. I don't yeah, know. sure. Yeah. Juniper yeah. berries. <laughs> <laughs> light can travel the speed it does because the photons that make up light have a mass of zero. So it needs less energy to push yes. it. So yes. it can just go as fast as it wants. This method of time travel would also be a one-way ticket. The traveler would be unable to return to their own time. So basically, we can, if we find some way to slingshot ourselves in the future, it is theoretically possible, but we couldn't come back. Right. And you know, I've thought about it. I've thought about time travel. <laughs> yeah. Haven't we all? And I was thinking like, okay, let's say I spent, I decided one morning I'm going to wake up and I'm going to, I'm going to create a time machine. I actually, uh, when I was a kid, I took apart a bunch of random electronics and I tried to smash them together to make a time machine. Yeah, we'll see. It, it, I think it worked, but maybe not. But the thing is, the butterfly effect thing. Like, like, yes. Like, if I, I just don't think it'd be fair for like you. Like, I could travel. Yeah. Like, I could time travel. But then what happens to you? Like, it just, I totally screw your crap up. When I was doing this research, funnily enough, uh, actual like theoretical physicists think that the butterfly effect wouldn't actually happen, that the universe would correct itself. So I would think we would all have to do it at the same time. Cause I was thinking maybe this is irrelevant, (laughs) but I was wondering why on online video games that has like weather daylight nighttime, it doesn't allow you to change it on online multiplayer games. Correct. Because then I'd be changing your time. And how would that be fair? That wouldn't be cool. Maybe you don't want it to be daylight. <laughs> I want it to be daylight. But maybe you want the nighttime. Sure. But I want it daylight. Yeah. So. I am I'm. I think I'm following you. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> These are just the thoughts. As long as you're thinking about it, that's all we want. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> it's LSD, guys. Yeah, it's, it's all LSD. <laughs> Forget everything we just said <laughs> about Einstein, about all these weird experiences and the dinosaur. It's all LSD. Anyways, that's traveling into the future. Right. But what about traveling to the past? What about it? Well, we can't use time dilation for that, but we can possibly use an Einstein-Rosen bridge, uh, a type of wormhole. Okay. Wormholes are theoretical areas of space-time that are warped in a way that connects two distant points in space. This is the classic pencil through the folded piece of paper metaphor. If the wormhole was stable enough, it might be theoretically possible to connect two different points in time. Okay. Which would also connect two different points in space because space and time are are woven in the same fabric. Right. The problem with this is that we require knowledge of other physics that we just don't have, like hypothetical particles and states of matter that violate the known laws of physics. 
We at least don't have knowledge of anything such thing. Yes. Yet. Yes. Okay. Don't but we will because we're scientists. Yes. And if that didn't prove her, we're right coming there, up with it. Just be if patient. If that didn't prove her right there, all that paragraph, then I don't, I don't know what would. The late and great, rest in peace, Stephen Hawking gave his opinion on backward time travel in his book, Black Holes and Baby Universes. Which we've totally read. Don't do a Stephen Hawking voice. <laughs> <laughs> I might see if I, could try, if I can find one and throw it in there. I would love Don't to do that. Don't bash that. The best evidence we have that time travel into the past is not possible and never will be is that we have not been invaded by hordes of tourists from the future. The best evidence that we have that time travel into the past is not possible and never will be is that we have not been invaded by hordes of tourists from the future. Hmm. Hawking even famously <laughs> hosted a champagne party for time travelers, not releasing the invitations until after the party had taken place. Clever. You are cordially, <laughs> you are cordially invited to a reception for time travelers hosted by Professor Stephen Hawking. The invite says... To be held in the past at the University of Cambridge, Gonville, and Caius College, Trinity Street, Cambridge. It also added the latitude and long longitude, the date of June 28, 2009, and the very necessary disclaimer, no RSVP required. BYOB. Yeah, <laughs> of course. BYOFB. Bring your own future beer. Uh, yeah. BYO. Do you think that LSD. time travels actually exist? They can drink their beer and then go back in time and then drink the same beer again and just keep doing that over and over until they're drunk? Mm, possibly. It's very cost effective. <laughs> I wonder if people are getting tired of me mentioning LSD. It's like I'm beating off a dead horse. <laughs> I don't think that's how the saying goes. Is it not? <laughs> Is it not beating off a dead horse? Hmm. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm not going to correct you because okay. I, I like that one better. <laughs> Unfortunately, no one showed up to this Stephen Hawking party. Rude. Maybe the invitations of or the story of this party survived long enough for future travelers to see them. Hmm? Maybe time travelers can't control what exact time they go to. Or maybe they're just dicks who don't want to party with one of the greatest scientific minds of our history. You know what I say to that, Gary? Their loss. Yeah, exactly. How rude. If I could time travel back in time, I would definitely go to Stephen Hawking's party. I stand with Stephen Hawking, damn it. <laughs> just, just <don't> yeah. <laughs> or maybe, maybe, maybe the party uh, was attended and uh, Hawking just kept it a secret. Hmm? I knew it. Time travel's real, but Hawking didn't want Does us to know. Does he seem like somebody who would do that? He didn't think we were ready, Gary. I mean, if I've watched interview, I mean, he seems like a pretty funny guy. Oh, yeah, he seems great. But I don't know. I Maybe don't there was a reason he kept a secret from us. Maybe sure. the travelers came back. Not to back mention, I mean, look, everybody, everybody, he was, I'm sure he had tons of contacts. There's no way nobody knew about it. And nobody would show up. And that's just. No, stupid. only time travelers show up. He was the only, uh, he was the only present person there at the party. Everyone else who showed up at the party was time travelers. Okay. <laughs> 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 and uh and there we go from uh turtle princesses to air raid bombings to subarctic dinosaurs to theoretical physicists that's all the time we have to talk about time slips or is it oh i could go on and on yeah other than the first couple of stories boring you to death any other thoughts on this no, no. You ready to but wrap I mean, it up and i didn't mean nothing bad about that i just come on gary you i did all this research no 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 no. Like, it wasn't nothing against Darren, you i don't appreciate your efforts it well. wasn't no i appreciate your effort <laughs> no just that uh, there's just been we all have episodes that are like we that, all have I'm episodes sure. that we like i'm sure our listeners do too yeah um, i mean some are going to be better than others yeah, uh, tell us your oh. tell us what your favorite episodes are too. Yeah, um, my some a couple of mine were the fiends of the Philippines episode. Um, I really like the Melonhead episode. Mine was interdimensional Sasquatch. That was a good one. That yeah. was really good. Yeah, we should could, definitely do something like that again. We should have my brother. If we could just there. edit it, if we could just edit Brent out of it. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> It's okay. I'm he doesn't joking. listen. So, yeah. no, that's what I told him earlier. I said I, I saw on the phone with him, and I said I'm going to Darren's. He's like, he's like, uh, you going to do the podcast? And I'm like. Yeah. And he goes, and it'd be nice to be invited to that. Yeah. He wants back on, but he hasn't even listened to his own episode. Yeah. He hasn't listened to a single episode <laughs> of our podcast. So until then, no podcast for you, Brent. Yeah. None for you. But yeah, tell us your, what your favorite episode is, mm -hmm. either through social media or uh, email us at gmail.com. Yeah. And as always, 
If you like the show, please leave a rating on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or wherever else uh, will let you leave a review. Anything else. It doesn't yeah, matter. It doesn't Facebook, matter. Um, some weird podcast app that we've never heard of. Just leave a review. It's just, anything helps. It really does help. And, and, you know, there's nothing better than seeing you know, five stars and whatnot. You know, oh yeah. At least. If you, if you have a one star review, you can just keep that to yourself. Well, we, we don't need that. No, I mean, you can do that, but, you can but tell us. leave a reason. Yeah. You, if you're going to one star, please put why so yeah. we can or cry ourselves to sleep and then maybe change it or better yet. Leave five stars. And then if you don't like it and then just leave the reason why you don't like it under, as the comment. Yes. But. You can do that as well. <laughs> you can do that as well. Yes, absolutely. Say five stars. These guys suck ass. Yeah, These guys are the worst podcast <laughs> I've ever heard. Five stars. In a world where everybody does podcasts, these guys are truly garbage. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on. We got to be better than some. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure <laughs> we've made it this far. Uh, we are on Facebook and Twitter as well as Instagram, Reddit, YouTube. Uh, and like Darren said earlier, TikTok. Um, yeah, you know how to find us on there. Just snipe on podcasts. It's not hard. Yeah. Pretty and it, easy. Yeah. The more people start going to that stuff, the more we'll be interactive with it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really just. Uh, yeah. I've been posting episode clips. Uh, I might post just a little bit of bloopers on there. I did really enjoy that clip you did for TikTok. That was so. that was just such a good clip. <laughs> If you uh, don't know what clip we're talking about, go to our TikTok and check it out. <laughs> yeah. Snipe on the podcast. And thank you for following us on TikTok, by the way. I wasn't expecting that much of a uh, gain in followers even after the promotion. So thank All you right. for that. Uh, we're also on Patreon where you can get some exclusive, super secret bonus content like blooper reel episodes and topic footing for as little as $1 a month. $5 tier gets you some extra spooky stories if you enjoy that part of our show. And now the $10 tier gets you all of that. Plus the raw and uncut episodes, which will be airing tonight in a sticker. Yeah, fun little sticker. Yeah. And of course, you can support us by clicking the support button at snipeoutpodcast.com. I don't blame you if you don't want to give us money, but we would uh, we would really like it if you did. Yeah. We like, we like money. We yeah, like to... Even a dollar. I keep getting new equipment, so, you know, Yeah. I could use that money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And as usual, if you have a topic suggestion, a question, comment, criticism, or if you just have a lot of time on your hands and maybe you've experienced a time slip, you know, you can uh, share that with us yeah, and we'll put it. it on our encounter series. Just contact us on social media or email us at snipehuntpodcast at gmail.com. And we have just enough time oh to slip in a final joke. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so Gary... I don't know if you knew this, but I'm actually very good friends with the other members of my time traveling club. Did you know that? No. no. Yeah. We go back years. <laughs> this is God bless. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, attend Hawking's party if you can. It looks like it was a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, we want to thank you for listening to Snipe Hunt. Your listening has been noted and will be reported to the proper authorities. All audio used was done so under fair use. The music you have heard in this episode was composed by Mayu, Nature World 1986, and Festlian Studios. We'll continue to search for the unexplained and hopefully see you on the next hunt. It's, it's one of these... Uh... <laughs>